I love it when I can find a piece of wood that's dusty or dirty and people don't see any value of it and we can take it and make it into something new and beautiful. I'm Alicia and I have a twin sister. I love to play disc golf, which is throwing frisbees in the forest, and I love to play with my three dogs. Ever since I was a kid, I always liked to create and make things, take something and figure out what I could make it into uh, rather than throw it away. I see things that have potential, that we can make them into new products and create something that no one saw out of that piece. Restoration Project came out of uh, a heart for wanting people with disabilities to have somewhere where they belonged. They might need a little bit of help, but that they were able to take pride in what they were learning and doing. And so we figured out how to teach woodworking as that process that they could take pride in what they were building and creating and be able to provide job opportunities for them. So we take materials that have been thrown away or discarded and we create uh, home decor products that can then be sold that generate an income for our artisans. We have volunteers that come work alongside all our artisans um, and our adults who have disabilities and they share their skills, they work together as a team to create amazing products and amazing um, projects that they come up with. We use reclaimed wood that's been thrown away. It might be dirty or have holes in it or cracks in it, but we're able to restore it and make it into something that's beautiful. And we do that because that's what God does with us. And so he's able to slowly take the layers away and make us into something new. And so we wanna reflect that in the work that we do here. Nowadays, having things that are made out of recycled materials is trendy, and so that's pretty amazing for us to be able to create products that are beautiful and trendy. Our artisans make cutting boards and coasters, they make signs, anything that's home decor related that we can make out of wood uh, and that they wanna create, we figure out how to make. I feel excited and amazed to be able to watch how much pride that our artisans get from being able to create even what seems like just a small piece. Uh, and it, being able to be there when someone buys that piece and the excitement that they have, um, that they are able to create something that someone saw value in. When I started Restoration Project, I didn't have it all figured out and I still don't have it all figured out, but I had an idea and I had a passion uh, and I had a heart for people with disabilities and that was enough to start from there. Here at Restoration Project, our artisans have been able to move beyond their disabilities and embrace their abilities. Oh my goodness, thank you, Alicia. What a great story that God uh, take something that seems to be discarded and make something new, both in the tactile, physical wood that's been thrown away, but also like just, just seeing value, worth, encouraging our brothers and sisters um, to, to, to create, to be part of something. And that just has the hallmark of the life, the teaching, the message of Jesus all over it. My goodness, I love our life stories, don't you? So as a reminder, our, our one story curriculum and these life stories that you hear week over week are for us and by us. And by that, I mean, it's like Meeting House folks recorded by Meeting House leaders and volunteers. Uh, and hopefully shared by you, the Meeting House, uh, with others around you. They are always Ooh, such an encouragement uh, to me, and I hope to you. Uh, and so I'll remind you, um, if you're in the practice, no smoke, no judgment. If you're in the practice of maybe stumbling onto the live stream a little bit late, 
you might be missing uh, some of these stories. So I will encourage you either go on our YouTube page or show up here on time uh, every Sunday morning. Uh, we're, we're trying to share these stories all the time and they're so encouraging, so encouraging. Well, welcome to our live stream experience here. My brothers and sisters, my friends, my name is Jimmy. I'm your live stream host this morning and teacher in just a, a few minutes. I will also make reference um, uh, the link to our Discord. And so if you are on Discord or you want to know of how and where to get plugged into that, you will see the link right there. Uh, hop on there and connect with some friends. And also, if you're here for the first time or the 500th time, say hi to somebody in the chat. Connect with somebody, reach out, ask questions. We want this to be a relational experience, not just a monologue. And so we're so glad that on a bright, sunny day, you could be choosing to do anything else, including sleep in, and you're choosing to be here. And I think it's just going to be such an uh, an excellent morning together. I'll also make me a reference that um, Q awkward transition uh, giving. So one of the ways that we support resource and fund the production, the recording, and the story sharing of our life stories is because of your faithful giving. And so if you're here for the first time uh, or the 500th time, if you're here being like, oh, uh, giving to a church, hmm, how does that work and why should I do that? Have a look. Go to meetinghouse.com slash give. Uh, see the ways that you can be partnered with and investing in what we're doing here at the Meeting House. Or maybe you've been ar around the Meeting House a long time and just haven't been able to um, to give. Maybe this is your opportunity. Maybe that story is the one that you needed to hear to, to, to hear about how we are resourcing, sharing these stories, sharing these experiences as a community. Same spot, though, if you want to learn how to give or re-engage your giving, go to the meetinghouse.com slash give. And thank you for considering that. We could not do this without you. We are in a brand new series. We just came through this series, Moses and Jesus and the space in, be in between. And today we're starting our series, God Only Knows, which has been a teaching series that we've come back to a number of times where we are asking the question, like, what is God saying to us as leaders uh, and pastors, as teachers and communicators in our local communities? What is God saying to us in the present moment? God only knows. And so across all of our sites today, uh, a number of our lead pastors are engaging with local teaching. Uh, some are dialing into the live stream. And so this is part one uh, of God only knows that will run for the next four weeks. So here in the live stream for the next couple weeks, it will be me and you, you and me. And then uh, the third week will be uh, Carmen. And then the fourth week will be Quincy. But if you are part of a local uh, site expression, there will be somebody at some point teaching live and local to you answering that question. God only knows what the Spirit is saying to us in the present moment. We want to transition now to our time of worship through music. Teaching is a part of worship. Giving is a part of worship. Uh, story sharing is a part of worship. And singing, engaging in creative arts is a part of worship as well. So I'm excited for us to, to, to sing together, to experience the arts together, and then jump into our teaching together, part one, what is the gospel in tattoos? I know this guy. It's going to be good. Let me pray for us and then we'll jump in. Jesus, thank you for your love, for your grace, that you are with us, that you are for us, that your spirit is, is um, inspiring the sharing of these stories. Thank you for the creative ways that you, that you illuminate and inspire, that you put our hands to the work uh, and the ways that we can share story together, including this teaching series. Thank you for the gift of music and creative arts, how it's the, the language of the imagination of our soul. And so may you meet with us here. May you inspire and inhabit the words and the phrases and the songs and the praises of your people. And so we pray these things with joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing together. the 
The good news is that every morning we have the choice not to be controlled by circumstances, nor our past, but by purposely designing our day, hence our lives better. Not to react to life, but to respond with love. Bernard Kelvin Clive The Christian should proselytize not because he thinks he can change everybody, he should proselytize because the gospel being shared is the ultimate act of love, because he thinks he can love everybody. Chris Jami. The gospel is the only good news there is. Layla Gifty Akita. The good news is as epic as it gets, with universal theological implications. And yet the Bible tells it from the perspective of fishermen and farmers, pregnant ladies and squirmy kids. This story about the nature of God and God's relationship to humanity smells like mud and manger hay and tastes like salt and wine. It is the biggest story and the smallest story all at once. The great quest for the one ring and the quiet friendship of Frodo and Sam. Rachel Held Evans. Our chaotic, confused world has no greater need than to hear the message of the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Billy Graham. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Paul, Acts, chapter 20, verse 24. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I was sent. Jesus. My goodness, exactly. The good news of the kingdom of God that has arrived here. That is why 
I've been sent. That's why we've been sent. This is what it's all about. But it's a question that rattles around in my brain for, for, for a long time. Like, what is the good news? I mean, in, in present day Christianity, even historic Christianity up until like, you know, the 300s, this is a, this is a conversation that's been uh, circulating around. What is the gospel? What is the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God, the centerpiece being Jesus? And why do we care? Like, where, where is this headed? What difference does it make in our lives at all? All right, we're going to jump right into our scripture here this morning. It's Acts chapter 20, Acts chapter 20. And this one is such a banger. It's so good. Okay, Acts chapter 20, verses 20 to 24. Now, if you've uh, never handled a Bible before, if you're, you know, investigating spirituality, we're so glad that you're here checking us out. If you go to the middle of the Bible and turn right, uh, it's the fifth book of the New Testament. So again, go to the middle of the Bible, turn right, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, and then go all the way to chapter 20, and we're going to be picking it up in verse 20 uh, to 24. And like I said, woof, woof, buckle up. Okay, this is Apostle Paul. I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. I've had one message, one for Jews and Greeks, Gentiles alike, the necessity of repenting, turning around from sin and turning to God and of, and of having faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am bound by the spirit to go to Jerusalem and I don't know what awaits me except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city, the jail and suffering lie ahead. Oh man. But my life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Now, a little bit of context about this text. We're reading an ancient document, a letter, in fact, uh, and this is the Apostle Paul. So the Apostle Paul has um, been converted from religion to irreligiosity. It's a fascinating journey. Now, Paul was a part of a subset of the religious population, the religious leaders at the time called the Pharisees. And the Pharisees were in charge of like upholding and codifying the law, the law of Moses, uh, basically encapsulating how do we follow the Bible? How do we follow Torah in order to please and not offend God? And so that something good happens here and in what are the, whatever the afterlife looks like. And so Paul was one of these team leaders who persecuted the early church, which is it's actually like a, a new rendering of uh, this, this first group of Jesus followers who called themselves the people of the way, the people of the way. And so Paul is persecuting these people. He's actually killing them saying, this is not how you do it. It's not how you do it. We've held this law, this way, this methodology of religiosity for so long. And if you depart from it, you deserve to die. And Paul experiences the risen Christ in a, in a, um, a beautiful, strangely poetic way. And so Paul is on his way uh, to, you know, persecute a, a young church, these people of the way. And he's met by the risen Christ. He's met by the risen Jesus. He has this experience, this mysterious encounter with Jesus. And Jesus does not say, I'm going to get you. I'm going to punish you. I'm going to, I'm going to. Instead, Jesus asks a question. He says, why do you persecute me? Why do you push against this thing that God is doing? And Paul reorients his whole life. He repents, he teshuvas, he turns the other way, leaves religion for this new way of spirituality that's centered on, on Jesus. Jesus as the centerpiece, the Messiah, the, the, the arrived one, the one who was to come. And it's fascinating what Paul does. Paul does not repeat necessarily the rhythms of religiosity that he held before. Instead, Paul uh, turns into this like, compassionate beast of a storyteller. He first learns under these first disciples who are much, much less educated than he is. Uh, and he, he learns the way, like, what is the spirit doing? The spirit now lives in me. The spirit is like writing these things on our hearts, Romans 2. Uh, and how do we get the story out? And Paul is actually one of the first apostles, which is like witnesses to Jesus, the first witnesses to Jesus, men and women, Paul included, that's, um, is like, we have to get this message out further than we have. Now, it's incredible that it, the first followers of Jesus like heard and embedded this message in their souls. And what's the message? That Jesus is, is God with us and for us, loving us and restoring us. Jesus is God with us and for us, loving us and restoring us. 
But it really just like at the time was like, we'll keep it with our people. We'll keep it with the, like the early witness of the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, and then we'll see where it goes. And Paul is one of those initial first disciples, uh, apostles, storytellers who's like, no, no, this has got to get way further than this, way further. Can't just stay with us. The gospel has got to get out. Now, there's my intro right there. So we picked this section up. This is the book of Acts. So this is uh, Luke is the writer. He, he writes Luke Acts, which is one large book about what did we learn about Jesus? And what do we learn that the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones, the people of the way, did with what they heard about Jesus? Now, by the time of the arrival of Acts chapter 20, Paul is finishing up his third missionary journey, which means he went out. He went outside of the realm, the context, the even like stranglehold of religion. It was like, let's get this gospel out to the Greeks, the Macedonians, anybody, Gentiles who needs to hear the good news of the arrival of the kingdom of God, which is what we've been talking about for, for centuries now. Now we can actually do it. Now he's, he's going back to Jerusalem uh, in time for the, the text says, uh, for Pentecost, which is this um, huge religious ceremony. And Paul has also experienced or heard about in Acts 2, the first time that this happened, that people were gifted the ability to speak in other languages, to communicate the gospel. Probably a lot less mysterious in terms of, uh, you know, what happened. These tongues of fire rain down on people and they are able to talk to each other. And so Paul is, is finishing up his third missionary journey. He's headed back to Jerusalem and he's not clamoring for power, which is fascinating. So interesting. He's not clamoring for power. Did you catch that in the opening text? Paul says, I'm bound by the spirit to go to Jerusalem. And I don't know what awaits me, except that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that we're going to conquer and take over. No, nope, tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. But, and here it is right here. Here it is. My life is worth nothing to me unless I use it for finishing the work assigned to me by the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's the work? The work of telling others, telling, storytelling the good news about the wonderful grace of God. The wonderful grace of God. Now, this is my life first, and it's a fascinating one. It's the one that, like, you know, if you've ever read something in a book or a poem or heard, um, you know, a, a piece of music or you watched a movie, that, that thing that just, like, entrenches itself, it, like, writes itself on your heart, and you're like, oh, that grabs me, that holds me, that, that's so meaningful to me. This verse is that verse for me. And so I actually have it tattooed on my arm right here, I'm amongst a smattering of, of other tattoos. Now, you may, may, may be asking yourself, self, why does Jimmy have so many tattoos? Like, what's the deal? Isn't God kind of against that? Thank you for asking. I'm glad you did. Um, yeah, th the story of my tattoos and the story of this tattoo is embedded in a larger story. If I wish I could stand here as a pastor and say, oh man, my, my faith in Jesus has always just been rock solid, steady, stalwart, consistent. Uh, to be honest, it hasn't. I've always been somebody who struggles with doubt. Of, especially when I was younger in my faith journey, being one who's like, what, what if? What if I'm wrong? What if there, like, there's a question that will come at me as a pastor or somebody who's studying the way that like, upsets the apple cart, that, that tells me to go the other way or just like, reinforces these struggles that I'm having? And so Acts chapter 20, specifically verse 24, was that verse that just like, seared itself, etched itself, tattooed itself on my heart. And so my tattoo journey, like getting all of these markings on my body was um, a way of uh, having Jesus like written on me, my journey of faith on me while it continued to grow in me, if that makes sense. It was one of those ways where I was like, I'm so captured by this person and this possibility, I don't want to let it go. And so it's a very physical, tactile reminder of like, me carrying this message around. Now, obviously tattoos are not for everybody, uh, but this has been kind of the demarcation of my consistent journey through doubt towards faith, love, uh, the following, being a disciple of, a follower of Jesus. Now, I remember one of my first tattoos, I was in a tattoo shop out west in Canada, and uh, any time that like as a pastor, I walk into a, t a tattoo shop, there's like, there's a little bit of a prelude that we have to, to get through. And so I'd had a couple tattoos before and we were actually like working on this Bible verse on the inside of my arm. And he was just like, like 
dude, we've gotten to this guy whose name is his name is Mike. Um, he's like, we've we've done a couple tattoos on you here. I just don't get it. And I was like, oh, uh, all right. Well, we've got a few hours together here today. What is it that you don't get? He's like, well, is like, is your church okay with this? I was like. I guess, I guess we'll see. <laughs> but at the time I was like, I don't know. I just like, that wasn't the, the first thing on my heart and mind. Maybe it should have been, but on my heart and mind is like, this is so meaningful to me. I know my own propensity to like dissuade myself, pers- persuade myself away. I just, I just need to have it on my body as a constant reminder, a constant reminder written on my body and on my heart to, to remember where I'm headed. And he kind of liked that, zzz, continues on. He's like, okay, like I get it. That's great. I'm mad respect for you. But it just seems to me, he said, and I'll never forget this, that like when people become more religious, they become way more shut off from people like me. There just seems to be no room. It's fascinating. Jesus, uh, one of these religious leaders, lawyers, comes to one of his disciples and they say, why does your teacher hang out with sinners? Why don't your followers keep Sabbath, keep the rules? Why does your rabbi like eat and drink with people who he shouldn't? The good news of the gospel of Jesus, what's it about? Is it just to make religious people more religious? Or is this accessible, connective, intuitive, holistic, deeply embedded in our hearts and minds and spirit? Is the good news something that moves out, affects people, cares for people, paints the picture of a God who is here, who is with, who is loving, who is reconciling, who wants us to turn towards who we're always designed to be, and a God who is wanting to bust open the doors of the sacred and the religious and get to the heart of people who need to hear that God is is loving, that God is forgiving, and that God cares about them and what they do with their lives, just like my friend Mike. So what is the gospel? It's a fascinating word. It's actually an English rendering of a bit of a Hebrew word and more popularized, well, I mean, in the last thousand uh, of years, um, a Greek word. The Greek word is euangelion, euangelion, which means um, a good story, good news, good storytelling, a good telling that something good has happened. Now, from a Jewish context, predating like this Greek rendering, and certainly the the apostles, the first disciples' understanding of good news, euangelion, story getting out, comes from Isaiah uh, chapter 52, which says how beautiful, and you've probably heard this before if you've been around uh, church for any length of time, Isaiah 52 verse 7, we're going to speed through it really quick. How beautiful on the mountains are the feet of the messenger, who brings good news, euangelion, the good message, the good telling, something good has happened. The good news of what? Peace and salvation, not rulership, ownership, power, peace and salvation. The good news that the God of Israel reigns, that the God of Israel, this, this, this God who uh, restores, who uh, restores the, this slave nation into something that will be a blessing for the world, that the God of Israel reigns is in charge. Now, fascinating, this is actually what Jesus gets to in the inauguration, the announcement of his kingdom work uh, in Luke chapter four. The announcement of the good news is official. And so Jesus is teaching in synagogue and he, he did that actually infrequently. It's, there's, no, um, there's not a lot of record of Jesus is actually going to church and teaching a sermon. And said Jesus is out on the shores, the seasides, the towns, the villages, uh, the pubs, uh, and the, the parks, meeting with people and connecting. But this is one of those records, and it's fascinating what he chooses to do. Jesus has passed the Isaiah scroll. So remember, in uh, you know, the ancient Near East at the time, there was no like there was no Bible book that people held like this, which is such a, a gift to, to have, to have. But instead there were scrolls big uh, rolled up pieces of parchment, uh, papyrus paper, which like ancient texts were recorded on and lived at the church, at synagogue, uh, at temple, so that they could be read and taught. He unrolls the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. 
He has sent me to proclaim the captives will be released, the blind will see, the oppressed will be set free, and that the time of the Lord's favor has come, that the time of the Lord's favor for the earth, his care for the earth, the the reign of God through Jesus is here. And then he rolled up the scroll, handed it back to the attendant, and sat down, and all the eyes of the church folks, the religious folks, people in the synagogue looked at him intently. And then he began to speak to them and he said, the scripture you've just heard has been fulfilled this very day. Everyone spoke well of him, was amazed by how gracious his words were that came from his lips. How can this be, they asked. Isn't this Joseph's son? (laughs) Well, come on, that's Jesus adheres to so few religious rules in this context. Now, the, the very next section of the verse that Jesus does not quote is in also the time of God's vengeance and judgment. And Jesus is inferring like, no, no, no. This is not just about making religious people more religious or Christians more comfortable or, you know, the, the rituals of religion more codified. Instead, Jesus is like, this is the announcement that the kingdom is here, that God is here in your midst, that God is here in the center of who you are in your hearts and minds, but also God is showing you what it looks like to be human. And what does it look like in this kingdom to be human? It's announcing the year of the Lord's favor of freedom for those who are poor, marginalized, distressed, weighed down, broken, burdened by religion, that God is announcing freedom to the captives, those who have been handcuffed by their own sense of sin, certainly, or their own sense of religiosity. There is a new way. Now, it's also fascinating at the time of Jesus, the word euangelion, a good news gospel, was likely I mean, it's the, it's the trickiness of, of Jesus, brilliance of Jesus, obviously. He's borrowing a very Roman Caesar-bound term. Now, by Caesar, I don't mean like a spicy tomato-based drink or uh, a cool 90s haircut. These were, these were the people in charge at the time. These were people that oversaw the Roman Empire. Now, it's fascinating and, uh, you know, just a, a couple decades before Jesus, there was found an inscription by uh, on a coin minted by the w- with the image of Tiberius, who was a Roman emperor, one of the people in charge of the entire known world at the time, including the including the Jew- Jewish world. As a Jewish brother or sister, in order to practice your religion, y- you had to gain permission from Rome. So things were not good. And uh, on this coin, uh, it identifies Tiberius as emperor Caesar, son of the divine of Augustus. Son of God and high priest. (laughs) It's a few decades before Jesus. The good news is that there is a son of God and a high priest who lives here on your behalf. The intermediary between you and God and his name is Augustus and Tiberius, his son. Now the Caesars had their deity and power uh, written and etched everywhere, everywhere into buildings, on coins, uh, with statues, busts that were made, including like seaport, huge statues that were made as a reminder that they were in charge. That if you're looking to know, to understand, or to see what God was like, uh, it was them. These were those reminders. They were the divine or the sons of the divine. They were in charge. And this is where it gets interesting. The first creed reminder poem, um, of the people of the way, these first Christians, the early Christians, what they shared and repeated was this. And Paul pens this in his letters as well. Jesus is Lord. Okay, I'm going to say that again. In our Western ears, when we hear Jesus, Lord, yeah, 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 we go to church on Sunday, yeah, yeah. This was a subversive, crazy political, world affecting thing to say. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is, not Caesar. Not the other gods, not Artemis, not these graven images that people are carving just to, you know, have some semblance of like safety and solace. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is. And they maintained this, that uh, it didn't need to be written on buildings or in temple or synagogues or coins, but, but Jesus is Lord by the spirit is, is carved on our hearts, is written tattooed, I would say. The good news of the gospel is written on our hearts. And so for them and for us today, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Simply put, Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us 
and restoring us. If you forget everything else that we've walked through today, I hope that you remember that. Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. Jesus is God with us. That God is not somewhere else, you know, an old bearded man in the sky with crossed arms waiting to rain down judgment. Jesus is here. Jesus existed as an historic historical figure in the, in the world that he created. He came and, and practiced presence with people to show people what they needed to turn away from, to repent, to turn around, and what it meant to be human, to be loved by God and to be loved by God enough to show us how to do it. Jesus is God with us and for us, loving us and restoring us. Okay, restoring us from what? From a broken sense of reli- religiosity that just following the rules, I guess, is what gets you in. no. No, Jesus restores us to the life that we were always designed to live. And what is that life? Well, actually, the gospel spells it out. Uh, Peace, other-centeredness, love, grace, forgiveness, mercy, announcing the favor of God, the blessing of God, the care of God for the poor, the marginalized, the disenfranchised, the mics, the tattooed, the people in the pubs and in the parks, and not just the people in the pews. And so who is the gospel for? What is the gospel? Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. And what is, uh, who is the gospel for? Everyone, always, full stop. That's the tweet. Everyone, always. Because good news, like Paul said, gets out. It goes somewhere. It doesn't just live in, uh, shut into, you know, our, our sense of synagogue or temple or church or even our prayer closets at home. None of those, th- those things are inherently bad, but the gospel gets out. The gospel lives in and gets out. It's etched and written on our hearts or our bodies, and then it gets out through storytelling, through active presence, modeled wonderfully by Jesus, uh, active storytelling and presence with those who need to hear it the most. Tattooed and far from God or no tattoos and super religious. It is the same message. Acts 20 verse 24. My life is worth nothing, nothing, unless I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus. And what is the work? The work of telling the good news about the wonderful grace of God. Telling others that the, the Gentiles, the Jews, the Greeks, the slaves, the free men, women, children, young, old, the good news about the wonderful grace of God. And why is it good news? Well, because Jesus shows us what God looks like. And what is God like? God is love. God is love. God cares about our existence. God cares about our identity. God cares about what we do with our time, energy, time, talents, our bank accounts, who we talk to, who we connect to. God is not okay with just like leaving us with safe passage that life just hopefully will be easiest, easiest as possible. Nothing affects me. I'm just safe until I die and I go somewhere else better. No, no, this is a misuse of the good news of the gospel of grace. It's including people. It's getting the good news out. It's using everything in your power to tell the work of telling the world about the good news of this Jesus that we follow as Lord and Savior, teacher, storyteller, rabbi, how to be human. This is the good news that gets out. And it's good news because it shows us that God is love and that this is marked on our hearts. It's guided by the spirit. It's embedded in relationship with God and with each other, with God and with neighbor, that Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. Oh, amen. Yes, right. Yes, Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. So at the end of that tattoo, um, you know, it's kind of quiet. I'd given my pitch. He'd given his struggles of, you know, growing up in a religious context that was pretty damaging, pretty traumatic, pretty painful for him. And then after a number of moments of silence, you know, he's kind of like wiping uh, off the tattoo and getting it all bandaged up. And he's just like, I don't, I don't really know how to say this to you, Jimmy, but this has actually been helpful. I'm like, oh, thank God, <laughs> because I want a discount next time. Uh, this has been helpful. Like you are maybe one of like three people that I can name that painted a better picture of like what following Jesus or being a religious person, which was his actual language, a religious person could look like. So 
I have a question for you, brother. And I was like, yeah, amazing. I mean, there's been lots of questions throughout this tattoo, but fire away. He asked if there, he's like, are there more people like you? Are there more people like, you know, the other two friends that uh, seem a little bit more uh, able to engage and be honest and vulnerable, open and direct with some of my questions? Are there more people like you? Like, do you go to a church? Are you part of a, a religious assembly that invites people who look, sound, act, and feel like me? In other words, I would say, to summarize Mike, is this really good news? Is it? Is it actually good news or is this just bad news with sweet wrapping paper? And that's the question for us. Is it good news? Do we have a story to tell? Do we live in the life and breath, experience, presence of God with the centerpiece being Jesus that is good news etched, tattooed on our hearts and minds with words and actions that are opening doors and inviting people into the fullness of God's love and restoration project or are we still trapped within the prison of religion that shuts doors, closes them, and locks them so that we're safe, secure, settled in our sense of who and how God expects us to act? Again, this is fascinating that, that Jesus was the, the consummate door opener kicking the doors of religion open with the good news of the favor of God, the arrival of the kingdom of God, rather than shutting people out with the dangers of religion. Why does your teacher sit in the pubs and walk in the parks? Why does your teacher eat with sinners and drink with sinners and not keep Sabbath? It is because Jesus is not somewhere else. Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. So wherever you find yourself today, whether it be uh, in a workplace that isn't great, whether it be in a a season of doubt that doesn't feel great, or whether it be in, uh, you know, uh, the opposite of all those things, feeling like you're connected with God, where you're, you're living in daily, daily, the presence, the love, the experience of Jesus made flesh, made real, etched on your hearts today. May you know that you have a story to tell. May you know that the gospel of the grace of God and Jesus is good news. May you know that God is with us and for us, loving us and restoring us. And may we be a group of people that kicks open the doors of religion and engages in relationship with God and neighbors, brothers and sisters who need to hear that God is love. God is here. God is with them and God is restoring the world through peace, through love, through forgiveness, through other centeredness. And may the grace and peace, the good news of Jesus be tattooed on your hearts, on your minds and go with you today in the place that you work and you live and you play. And together we said, amen. Amen, brothers and sisters.
Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. <laughs> so good. I like that guy. I really do. Yeah, Jesus is God with us and for us. Jesus is God loving us and restoring us. So we hope that, like I said earlier in our experience here, that uh, you, you will help us turn this into a dialogue, not just a monologue. And so we have home churches online, certainly. There are online options for you to connect to take this conversation uh, further. So we hope that you will check out, um, you know, themeetinghouse.com slash home church and continue the conversation. Even if you've never been to a home church before or it's been a minute since you have been, what a great opportunity to, to, to share your own story of the good news of the grace of Jesus uh, and, uh, you know, be with other like-minded brothers and sisters along for the journey. So yeah, all the information is there, themeetinghouse.com slash home church. Um, I want to pray for us too, that we would have the courage to live in the presence of Jesus that embraces and engages doubt in process, but that reminds us that this is good news, that we have a good story, Evangelion, a good news story to share with the world. So I want to pray that Jesus, by his spirit, will give us courage to do it. Let me pray, and then we will send you off for the rest of your wonderful, uh, wonderful Sunday. Jesus, we thank you for the presence, the indwelling, the living in of your spirit that, like we just heard, writes this, writes this on our hearts, on our minds, on our souls. Would you encourage us in those moments where we feel rattled by questions and doubts that you walk alongside, um, that you cover us with your peace? Would you encourage us and give us courage to, in those moments uh, with brothers and sisters who seem far from you, Jesus, that we would be a loving and gentle presence of the good news of the grace of Jesus? And God, would you continue to uh, raise up, give us the inspiration and courage to share the good news with uh, the world that needs to hear it? And may you go with us today and this week in Jesus' name and together we all said, amen. Amen. Grace and peace, brothers and sisters. Enjoy the rest of your week and we will see you next time.